Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation to talk in, in this seminar, which is, I have to say, has become quite a fixture in the, in the number theory uh, calendar um, of worldwide. And it's, uh, I think the organizers have to be thanked for this, for this brilliant idea. Anyway, um, the, um, the material, the subject I want to talk about, and just a, it's just going to be a survey, basically, I'm not going to go into any great detail, is a subject which has interested me for um, well over 40 years, nearly 50 actually, and uh, which um, has had quite a bit of activity over that period, and, um, um, and even quite recently. So uh, let me, first of all, uh, start off by um, mentioning the first um, theorem that was proved of the kind I want to talk about. This is due to Hugh Montgomery, in 1970, and this concerns the um, um, prime number theory, basically, uh, the distribution of primes in arithmetic regressions. The psi function here is the standard function of, of prime number theory. I'm going to use that function rather than the alternatives um, of theta or pi, which are sometimes used, simply because in some ways it's closer to the analysis with the von Mangold function here, which of course, as I think everybody will know, is that is, um, Basically, the, if you have a prime power, it's a logarithm of the prime, and otherwise it's zero. So basically, it's a weighted version of counting primes. Okay, so the, the rather interesting discovery that Q made was that there's actually, if you, if you take Q to be large enough, there's an asymptotic formula for V of X Q. Um, and the, the main term is Q X log X. Um, and this, this is kind of remarkable in a way, because it says, if you think about it, okay, you just sort of divide by capital Q to sort of replace the sum here. And then you think, well, you've got roughly Q terms here. So this says that this, this expression here is about the square root of X divided by the square root of Q. It's actually better than the Riemann hypothesis <laughs> on average. And, and, and um, that I think it really makes it sort of quite exciting and interesting in, in some regards. Um, as far as utility is concerned, well, you're averaging over so many things that it's probably not so useful in applications. I have seen one application by George Graves, I think, where he was doing some sieving in several dimensions, maybe a form of some kind in two, in two variables, um, where it was useful to have uh, the sum over all the all the, all the residue classes modulo Q, all the relevant residue classes modulo Q. Okay. Um, okay, so um, the Hooley uh, contribution came a, a few years later where he found um, a much simpler proof um, and a, a somewhat more precise uh, result. In fact, if I just go back, you can see here, this error term is not particularly good. I mean, if, if Q, is um, um, x divided by log x or something. This is already, you know, almost the same size as the main term. Um, and what happened was that um, Hooley's argument made it fairly easy to isolate that particular term. But you can see that if Q is very close to x, this, this term here also starts to um, get close to the main term. So you have, a, you have an asymptotic formula, but it's not very precise um, or not as precise as you might hope. Anyway, so that's a feature of the result, but still it is an asymptotic formula for, for at least if Q is greater than X divided by log X to some fixed power. Okay, so, um, so I've made that observation. Um, and the, I should have said that there's a good reason why you can't expect to be a fantastically good asymptotic formula, because if, if uh, Q is uh, say proportional to X, X over two, or even X over roughly, something like X over log X, well, the number of primes is smaller than Q. So you don't have enough primes to go around in the residue classes. So some of these are gonna be empty. Um, and so this expression here, x over five q, is not such a good approximation to the to the psi function. Okay, if q is smaller, of course, you expect it to be a good approximation. 
But uh, as Q, as capital Q grows towards X, you can see that you get this diminution in, in quality of the result as a consequence. Okay. Um, so the, those are things which will come up later in the talk. Okay. There, there was, of course, uh, earlier uh, work by Barban and then Davenport and Halberstam and by um, Patrick Gallagher, um, getting upper bounds for V of X and Q. Um, and it was closely connected, of course, with a large sieve. And um, uh, you can get a, a result of this quality if, if Q is at most um, X divided by the power of logarithms. And um, the actual power you require in order to gain a log X to the A here was worked out first by Davenport and Halberstam, and then Gallagher got the precise result. Um, and actually, um, as far as asymptotics are concerned, Barban had apparently stated an asymptotic result when Q, capital Q is equal to X. Um, I have to say, I haven't seen this paper. It's in a journal which is not readily available to me. And uh, it's actually quite short, as far as I can tell from, from the um, details, from the reference. So I'm not sure whether it actually carries any proofs in it. And I will, one can speculate as to, about, as to how he would prove something like that. It's not, you know, writing down a proof is not that hard, but, he, but as I say, it's not clear exactly which method he used. Um, okay. Um, so I made this comment already, and the results are not very surprising. Um, I want to look at what the what ingredients are necessary in order to achieve a result of this kind. Um, and then see to what extent they could be applied in other circumstances. And one of the, if you look at Gallagher's proof of the, of the upper bound rather than the asymptotics, of course, this is a well-known proof. Uh, I think most people in the area are very familiar with it. Um, it, it's, it reveals two of the basic ingredients very, very succinctly. Um, so if you can use Dirichlet characters to pick out the residue classes, of course, and apply orthogonality and use the prime number theorem to deal with the, um, the principal character, modulo Q, then you end up by having to look at a sum like this, where now you've got one over five Q and the principal characters are omitted, modulo Q. And um, you can then replace the, the characters by primitive characters. Um, and um, well, with modulo, a little bit of detail, which has been omitted, uh, you have to worry about primes which divide Q and things like that, but we won't concern ourselves too much with little details like that. And you can see that um, this expression here, um, by partial summation, at least if um, R is greater than L, um, you can reduce to this situation here. And to that, um, you can apply the large sieve directly, um, or the character version of a large sieve, and you can see that you get X over L here, and then Q over, well, Q over M here times X log X. And, you, and if you take L to be a power of a logarithm, then you've dealt with a significant part of the problem. And then the, the piece out to capital L, you can treat with the single wolfish theorem, right? standard result on primes and arithmetic progressions. So, um, the, the proof is actually pretty simple for modulo the large sieve and modulo the single Walsh's theorem. And I like to think of these as being, um, the single Walsh's theorem sort of corresponds in the terminology I'm used to, to major arcs. And the large sieve in some sense corresponds to minor arcs. And if you think of Gallagher's proof of the large sieve inequality, for example, that in some sense uh, corresponds to, well, hardly little with method with the, uh, and, the, and the, the intervals really correspond to, in some sense, to minor arcs. Anyway, um, so you have these, these two ingredients, and we shall see those ingredients coming up again and again. Okay, how about the asymptotic formula? Well, there's a standard way of approaching this, um, at least it was a standard way for many years, is you just take your, your square and square it out. And when you do that, you get various sums. You should get at least um, 
three sums, right? You have to, and if you do some splitting, you get four. So from from the psi function squared, you get this, you get the combination S naught plus two S one, which comes here. And you can see these the residue classes here, and there's a special case when when the two elements are the same in, in the psi function. And then you get a, a diagonal term which rate, but reduces to S2, and then you get the term corresponding to the main terms. Okay, and these S2 and S3 are rather e easy to work out um, from prime number theory, or actually from elementary number theory. Uh, S0, of course, from prime number theory, you can work out. So the crucial sum is S1. And it looks like a problem in additive number theory, right? Additive prime number theory which is not surprising, it's what you'd expect. Okay. Um, and the question is, how do you deal with S1? Okay. Well, um, one way of dealing with S1 is to rewrite this sum, uh, collect together in one, in one function, the um, prime powers whose difference is H. And then, um, you can think of Q as dividing that difference. And so you've got a divisor function with, with a restricted range for the divisor, right? And uh, this is exactly what Hugh Montgomery did in his, uh, in, in his um, paper in 1970. And now this function R of X and H, you'd expect to be able to say something about it by Vinogradov's method. Um, think, think of, um, well, actually, the results of Chudikov, um, Esterman, and van der Korput, where they showed that almost every even number is a sum of two primes. The basic proof of that is the corresponding function where you have a plus instead of a minus, and you have a, an L2 mean for that. And you, the same technique works for this function. And you can replace it, essentially, in, in L2 mean by a singular series times of uh, something which counts the number of real solutions here, yeah, x minus h. And uh, this was actually worked out by Navrick in 1960, and it's what Hugh uses to, to deal with this sum, and then, and then gets the asymptotics for it. Okay, so that's, uh, it, the, the techni technically it's quite involved, of course, but it's, but it's, it's clear how, how one can do it. Um, but the, this idea, this method was really superseded by Hooley's brilliant idea. Um, so I can't, okay. The top of the screen on my screen has, dis, has disappeared between, behind the thing that says you are screen sharing. But anyway, <laughs> maybe I, that's a way of getting rid of that. Anyway, um, but um, okay. So, um, so you can probably see it and I can't. Um, but, um, Hooley's idea is, is you can use the large C of the Gallagher result, say, to deal with the smaller values of little q. And so you're left with the, um, the uh, values of big Q, which lie between this Q naught and X. And so um, you, you end up in, in that S1 function of having to deal with uh, something like this now. And you, you, you can think of dealing with a difference of two of these. One of them has Q naught and then the other one has Q. And the reason that Hooley writes it this way is for a very clever reason, a clever idea. Um, if you interchange the summations here, then write N minus M as Q times R. So R is the complementary factor. And you can see now that that complementary factor is actually pretty small. And what he does is, is switch variables. I mean, it's a bit like, it's, it's, like a Dirac, it's like Dirichlet's method of the, of the hyperbola. Only you only have a small portion of a hyperbola to deal with. And you switch from the long axis to the short, right? And the only, if you work out the inequalities here, the, the only constraints are on R and it's basically bounded above by N minus M. And then you can you switch that round again in the sums, and you see that you can produce a sum on the inside, an n, which uh, is greater than m plus r q and less than or equal to x. And, and the only condi other condition on n is that it's congruent to m mod r. 
but R now is no bigger than a power of logarithm. So you can use a single Wolfish theorem and get, and it's, it's a beautiful idea. I mean, the whole proof you could write down in a page, even, even with the detail. Um, so, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the method of choice is uh, to this day for this, this kind of problem. Um, uh, well, unless you run into some other difficulties. I mean, that's, you know, if you have a problem of this kind, this is the method you should choose. And if you have some other difficulties, then maybe you have to think outside the box, but that's another matter. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm, there are questions you can ask about, okay, you have a fixed Q. What can you say about things like the, this expression with the psi function, for example? Uh, and I may mention that a little bit, but my main concern is the double sign in, in things like this. Okay. And to what extent can you extend these ideas to functions other than psi? Well, Hooley wrote at least 20 papers on the subject. 19 of them have this, this, this generic title um, on the Barban Davenport Alberstam theorem. And there's one other paper that I know of, which was in the proceedings of the Vancouver ICM in 74. Um, and you may have written some other papers, but they, they, certainly 20. Um, and he was obviously fascinated by this whole, whole subject. Okay, um, now the primes have a huge advantage over other sequences in that they're uniformly distributed in the reduced residue classes. Um, and that makes life very easy. You know, you think of almost every other sequence that is of interest to natural in, in uh, number theory, like the square free numbers, for example. They are no longer that well distributed into residue classes. They, they vary at least according to the GCD of Q and the, and the residue class, modulus in the residue class. Um, and some other sequences are even worse than that. We, sh uh, we shall meet some which are um, quite painful in that aspect. Okay. Um, so that is, a, is always going to be a difficulty, I think, in generalizing these results. Okay. Um, I wish I could see this. Well, um, okay. So Hooley has a paper, I think it's, it's his third paper with the generic title, where he treats a, a rather general situation. It's not exactly like the primes, because now he's treating, if you think about what this means here, he's treating a set S which has positive density. So if you take Q equals one, you can see that he's saying that the, the density of his set is a constant times X. Right. So it's just different from the primes and nicer than the primes in some sense. Uh, and he has a criterion, which I don't understand why it's called criterion U, but that's a, that's a, well, there must be a reason for it. Um, and uh, it, it's basically is saying, well, we're going to assume a single Wolfish thing. We assume that we, have, we know for, for relatively small moduli um, the, uh, something about the distribution of our set, its elements of our set in residue classes modulo Q. Um, and you see that he has a, his dependence is really the GCD of Q and A, not, not A. Right. So it's still quite restrictive in some regards, but it does now include quite a lot of, of sequences of number theoretic interest. Okay. Um, the, the reason that he's able to manage this is because the large sieve allows it. You can always take out common factors in dealing with the large sieve basically relatively easily. Okay. And his final conclusion is that you get an upper bound of this quality, that you get QX plus an error, which is where you, um, you save a lot of logarithm, um, but nothing much more, of course. I mean, you, you, you can't expect to do any better than saving a power logarithm if all you put in is something which only saves a power logarithm. Uh, that seems reasonable. Anyway. Um, so um, 
this is this is quite interesting. You see the QX coming up here, and for the for the in the case of the primes, we had Q, QX log X. And it, I'm not giving too much away by pointing out that X log X is the is roughly the behavior of the von Mangold function squared on average. And here X or constant, I should say, is the average behavior of the function which would occurs here. Okay, so, um, uh, well, we'll come back to that. Uh, as far as the square free numbers are concerned, there's a very substantial history, and I will, uh, I've listed all the papers in the bibliography at the end for those who are interested. Uh, one can push the theory quite a long way for square free numbers, of course, as you might expect. Um, uh, and I've written out here the corresponding function, cap, function capital V. Uh, there's a question about what main term you should use as an approximation. I think for many, from an analytic point of view, this infinite series makes the best approximation. It's a kind of singular series. It corresponds anyway quite well to the, to the um, Number of, to the number of square free numbers which occur in the, in the particular residue class A modulo Q. Okay. Um, and it, it actually conforms to Hooley's requirements that really this function should only depend on the GCD of Q and A. And you can see basically that that's true. Okay. Um, so the result that one can get, the ultimate result, which is quite a lot of hard work, is you get a main term which look, starts to look different from the one we had, all the ones we've had before. You see, you've got x to the one over k, not, not x. And you've got a q to a much higher power, not, not q to the first power, but nearly the second power of k as well. Um, so you get something which is looking different from what I just mentioned, where you, I said, well, it looks like the main term corresponds to the square of some characteristic function, right? Clearly not the case here. Okay. Um, the error term also is quite good here, which you'd expect for something like the square free numbers. These functions F1 um, come out of the zero free region of the, Z, of the zeta function. We don't really want to go into detail. Um, okay. Um, but you, you still have a lack of uniformity as Q goes to X. You see how the, 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 the error term start here, it starts to blow up on one. This, this becomes basically a constant. And this becomes, wow, it's pretty close to X squared, right? I, I mean, it, 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 it approaches X squared. So you, get, you, you, you lose your uniformity again. And, the reason is, is the same one. You know, if, if Q is, at least if it's bigger than six over pi squared times X, there still aren't enough square free numbers to go around to fill all the residue classes. So this is not necessarily a particularly good approximation at that end. Okay. Okay. Um, another question which has been looked at is the distribution of smooth numbers in arithmetic progressions. Um, became a very topical subject in the 80s and 90s through various applications to, to cryptography, for example, to, to um, uh, numerical routines for factorization and stuff like that for computing the sizes of things. Also in, in Waring's problem, it became a, a useful tool. And so the, the distribution of these things in, in residue classes is quite interesting and rather complex. You, you know, for example, if um, the, the GCD of A and Q has a prime bigger than Y, uh, the, the Y, the Y smooth, there aren't any Y smooth numbers in your residue class. Um, and finding criteria which match that is sort of tricky if, if you're dealing with general sums. Okay, so the, the only result I know is due to Harper in 2012, and that's actually in our key, but I couldn't find anything in the refereed journal, so I'm not quite sure what happened to that. 
but it has quite a nice upper bound in here. Uh, and you can see again, you get Q. Now it's the size of 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 the of the number of of uh, y smooth numbers up to x as the main as the sort of main term, but it's not asymptotic formula. And I wonder if there is an asymptotic formula if one's been proved. But as I say, I couldn't find anything in the literature. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Yes, yeah, so there's an idea which was has been floating around and was first first appeared in print in the paper of, uh, that I wrote with Dan Goldston on the distribution of psi of x, uh, psi of x uh, Q and A, um, the, the primes, um, assuming the Riemann hypothesis. And there's there's quite a bit of work assuming the Riemann hypothesis because one can push things quite a bit further. Um, and we found a way which was at least as good as the Hooley technique, um, and which has turned out to be useful in those situations where the Hooley technique doesn't necessarily work as well. Okay, so let me go back to the sum S1, and go back to Hugh Montgomery's original idea of basing things on Vinogradov's method. Okay, well, this sum S1, you can write it as an integral with exponential sums. If you take F of alpha to be this sum Q less than equal capital Q, R less than equal X over Q, E of alpha Q, R, and then G of alpha to be the corresponding generating function for the von Mangold function, and use the orthogonality of the additive characters to compute this integral, you can see you've got exactly S1. And to, uh, in, in, Hugh, Hugh, what Hugh did was equivalent to applying Vinogradov's method to one of the functions G. And then the, the rest of the integral basically by um, a pass of R's identity or Cauchy Schwarz and pass of R's identity. But there is another approach you can take to this. You see this function F, it's a, it's a very easy function to deal with. And it's very easy to show that it's small on the minor arcs, much easier than using Vinogradov's method. So you can actually avoid Vinogradov's method completely and just use the estimate for f on the minor arcs and then apply Parseval to the function g squared. So it gives actually a proof. It's longer than Hooley's method, but it's a proof which is still quite elementary. It doesn't use anything deeper than the prime number theorem. Okay, um, well, maybe the single Wolfish theorem to work out the major arcs. Okay. Um, and it has some advantages of flexibility because it doesn't use the large sieve. It doesn't require your sequence to have positive density or to density have a size which is close to positive density. So there's a lot more flexibility available there. And if you Dealing with something, say with the Riemann hypothesis, it's relatively easy to take advantage of that in the methods as well. Anyway, um, so that although it's not as simple as Hooley's method, it has some advantages. Okay. Um, so let me just suppose that A sub N is a real sequence satisfying the L2 mean bounded by X. Uh, and uh, let's, let's have a siegel wolfish condition, uh, which uh, psi of x is some, this, this psi of x is some function going to infinity at a reasonable rate, <laughs> probably a power of a logarithm or something like that. Um, and you can compute the asymptotics by the method I just described of v of x and q, and you get a main term, which I've written here, I haven't said anything about the error term. The error term is somewhat complicated. And you, the, you see here, you get your a n squared, which is, uh, um, well, in the prime the case of primes, because this, this condition avoids the, the, prime, uh, the um, von Mangold function. But still, 
Uh, in that case, you would have x log x here still. And in the, in the case of square freeze, which this satisfies, you would have, again, something which corresponds to the square freeze as your main term. But now you've got another term here. And although I've written this, this function g of q in this rather complicated form, it turns out that it corresponds to the um, major arcs. It, it's actually the singular series, which arises from considering that integral I wrote down previously. Okay. And you can see that if the, what you have here is something that corresponds to the um, L2 mean of the whole, you know, the whole integral. And this one corresponds to uh, major arcs. And so this difference ought to correspond to minor arcs. So this, what this says is, if your function v of a, if, if your functions are such that the main, that the minor arcs are large, then you're going to get something which behaves like qx. But if the minor arcs are small, as they are with, with the um, square free numbers, with the k-free numbers, then you get something that's smaller than that, substantially smaller than that. So you can, you can see that the behavior of V of X and Q is kind of intimately tied up with the behavior of that integral I wrote down previously. Let me just go back. So here, this integral, the thing, the, the integral that corresponds to this. Okay, very curious. Um, and say so the, the whole the, the behavior of V seems to depend quite closely on the on this difference in many, many circumstances. Okay. Um, so I've written out here what I just said. You have this sum here corresponds to this integral squared, and uh, the this corresponds to the major arcs of this thing. Okay. Um, and the actual the statement I made that, that this expression, the, the L2 mean, should be bounded by x. Of course, um, I already pointed out the von Wankel function um, is bigger, it doesn't, doesn't meet this criterion. But the same ideas will still work in that situation. Um, and you can see that, that, that in the case of the primes, this main term. Is, is x log x, and then you get some other stuff, which we know on the second order corresponds to the, to the um, in some sense, to, to the sum here. The one thing I should say, though, we know, it's a well-known fact that the integral here, when you have the von Mangal function, the, there's a positive contribution on, to the integral from the minor arcs. If, 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 if this was dominated by the major arc, you could prove a twin prime conjecture. Okay. Um, okay, so I think that covers everything I've said there. Now, um, okay, the next thing I want to talk about is something that, uh, yeah, this is a, a, in some, some sense a detour, but there's a, there's a remarkable paper that Hooley wrote in, in 98, I think in Krella. Um, where he deals with the third moment. It, of course, it's not the third, it's not the modulus, it's the just the third power of the difference here. Okay. Uh, I don't think anybody knows how to deal with the modulus uh, cubed. Um, he has this weight 5q in here, but you need some sort of weight in there because the, you expect the, the, um, t the thing you're summing to be dropping off to a relatively high power of q. And so, and so you would, summing over, over little q out to big q, you wouldn't get much benefit from the sum out to big q. And so in order to, to gain more benefit, you have to put a weight on which, which weights the larger values of q. And you might ask, why doesn't he use a smooth function here? That would be the obvious thing to do. Well, he, need, he has a lot of complications in working things out. And it turns out that things just cancel more nicely if we use Euler's function. Okay. Um, the, 
really runs into considerable difficulties with the process. The process is you cube out this, pro this uh, expression. So you now got four terms. And uh, three of those terms you can do by methods are fairly well established, right? I mean, this, the, the, this, the part coming from the x over five cube cubed is easy, the next part is easy. The, the one coming from the psi squared can be done just like the second moment. And then, so you're left with the third moment. And that, that means you have to deal with a product of three von, von Mangold functions, right? It turns out you can use Vinogradov's method. The depth is about the same depth as the Vinogradov ternary prime problem, but with, with complications. Um, and, Hooley's problem is to show that these four sums add up to zero. Basically, there's cancellation in the main terms, and you get and uh, the the expression is asymptotically equal to some collection of second order terms, right? which is the pattern that's established in the second moment. And it takes, I think, the paper is seventy five pages long, and I think about like forty of those pages are, are taken up showing that the these terms cancel out. Uh, and um, the, as a consequence, the paper is littered with quotations from Dante's Inferno, which uh, <laughs> you have to, it, it, it's quite a literary experience to read this paper, I have to say, <laughs> but not just because of that, but because of the language it is used generally. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would advise any student of the subject to have a, uh, peruse this paper for um, things other than the mathematics, because it's quite uh, interesting from that point of view. Anyway, uh, it's remarkable stuff. Okay. Um, and that the, the idea that Dan Goldston and I used, turns out can be used in this, on this um, problem to give uh, uh, a somewhat simpler approach. And, um, Okay, so let me just say that the core problem for the primes concerns really the, this sum here for, for the L2, for the second moment. And um, on, the, on the major arcs, you expect that this generating function behaves a bit like, well, if, it, if you're on the arc centered at A over Q, you'd expect it to behave like the Mobius function of Q divided by Euler's function of Q, um, um, twisted by um, a, a sum, which has its peak at A over Q. So you'd expect the term corresponding to A over Q here to be a, a very good approximation to G. And if you summed over all these, well, the other ones wouldn't add up to very much because they're points further away. So there's a technique which actually goes back to Hardy and Littlewood of approximating a generating function by this sub, by a sum of this kind. And was used extensively by, by Dampel and Heilbronn and others in the 1930s and by Roth even as late as 1950. It was later superseded by other methods. Um, for, but, but it's a useful technique. And here I've, we, we revived it um, for, for this situation. Uh, it makes quite a good way. The point is, it's independent of, when you write it in this way, it's independent of Q and A, right? But it's still a good approximation to all these places that you have to visit in the integral. Okay, so, um, okay, so the idea, remember we, in, the, in, the, in the original, Montgomery Hooley result, we have a main term of x over five q. Well, the idea here is to replace that main term by this expression, which is just a form of using this and then summing this over the n, which are in the residue class A modulo q. Okay. Okay. Seems a little complicated, right? But it actually has this feature that in here, you have a function G star, which is a good approximation to G throughout the whole of the minor arcs. Oh, sorry, major arcs. Okay. And I can't see that at the top again. Is there a way of removing this thing at the top of the page so I can see it? Anybody know how to do that? Okay. 
<laughs> I could I could stop using full page, I suppose, for uh, full screen. Anyway, um, Curtis, are you in full screen mode? Yes. Should I just exit full screen mode so I can see it? Doesn't really matter. Yeah. Maybe that'll work. Yeah. Does that work? I mean, you can see the the gubbins around the sides now. Of the, of the... Maybe you can also close that blue uh, thing that we with the oh, yeah. cross. How do I see a bit more? Oh yes. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, now I can see the top line at least. So, apologise for the. Um, <laughs> oh well, technical problems. Okay, so um, if you use this this new main term, um, you can you can actually you can then use Hooley's method of the flipping of the R and Q to prove this asymptotic form. It's actually easier than using the hardly liquid method, and you get a main term now of Qx log of x over R minus a, a, a second order term, and you get an error term which is now uniform as as Q approaches X. Okay, and the thing is that the point is that this this approximation you're using now takes account of the distribution into residue classes in a better way when Q is large. Okay, so that's an interesting. Uh, and, and then you can recover the original results by a bit of work too. But it gives an interesting approach, which is useful in quite a number of circumstances. And in particular, if you use this on the third moment, you can produce a very short proof of an asymptotic formula for the third moment. And you can see again, it's, it's uniform as Q approaches X. Because you can take R to be, well, your nice big fat power of a logarithm. Okay. So I've actually the bits here with the Q squared X log X log R, you can actually put that out explicitly as well if you needed to. So you can get a actually quite good asymptotics. I've just been, I've just shortened it for the page here. Okay. Um, um, Oh, something else you can see for the, this third moment is remarkable. You actually get better than the square root cancellation. If you, if you, if you, if you, you see the, the, the power of x, you'd, if you had square root cancellation, you'd expect it to be x to the three halves. Something remarkable going on there. I don't really, I've never really got to the bottom of that. It, probably some cancellation going on because of, the, of not having absolute values, but still. Okay. Um, Oh yeah, I get some justification of what's going on here, but I think we'll skip that. Um, okay, well, the, the, the comment I just made about um, square root cancellation. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so I wanted to say something about the this, this second moment of using this method. Um, and you can see that if you write, if you write um, now, this expression out, um, you don't need to split up. You don't need to square it out. You can write this difference as lambda n minus psi sub r of n squared, and you can write this directly as, the, as, uh, in, in, as an integral. Anyway, I, I won't go into detail too much, but you can see that you can get a direct application or a direct proof that this corresponds to, to the things that are going on, and that the division into major and minor arcs is a is a crucial part of the, of the problem. Okay, um, okay. So I, here's some details explaining what's going on with these various uh, with the with the third moment. It pretty much gives a little bit more detail about what I was saying. I don't think we're going to that now. Time is running a little short. Okay. Um, Okay, I wanted to talk about generalizations. Um, there are quite a few generalizations in the literature, some to algebraic number theory. There's, there's a paper by Smith in 2010 um, for um, number fields over number fields, where the primes are now in number fields with certain properties. Um, and there's an example of Keating and Rudnick on the uh, uh, an analog for function fields. Um, 
In all of these cases so far, these things are well behaved. Um, and I started having students look at situations which are not so well behaved. I had Mike Danks look at um, what happens if the function you have here is the number of ways of writing numbers of sum of two squares. So the, the first moment is well behaved for R of n. The second moment is a bit bigger. It, it grows like x log x. I think. And um, he was able to work uh, again an asymptotic formula for this. Um, and it has a similar character to the kinds we've seen before. Again, you can see the L2 mean coming up here for the R of n squared, there's the log x. Um, another example, which is a little bit more complicated, was looked at, I think, in a special case by Motohashi and then by Pong Zhiyam, um, the, the divisor function. And the, and the interesting thing about the divisor function is that the, the main term, the, the approximation, it doesn't factor into local into local factors in the same way in the way that the, all the other examples do. You you have a a factor which corresponds in here. There's a mix of the uh, of the local factors and the and and, and the x. It's a, it's, a, it's a real nuisance, right? And there's no way of avoiding it. Um, so. Um, that in it is of interest in itself. And this approximation, which we ended up using, is again the major arc approximation of the kind that I noted that we discussed before. Okay. And then with that, you can get, uh, it's a great deal of work to get an asymptotic formula, but you can get one. Uh, the, uh, again, I've, <laughs> if you write out all the detail, it takes out about a page just to write out what the main terms are. I've, I've written here P of log X log Q appears a polynomial of degree two, but the, in the thesis, the terms are all written out. Um, but you see again, you've got, um, it's uniform as Q goes to X. It's quite interesting. Okay. Um, then recently I had uh, Peng Yong Ding look at the case where now your, your function is the number of ways of writing a number as the sum of three uh, cubes. And this is a very interesting because we don't know the size of the second moment. If you look at this thing, all we know is that it lies somewhere between x and x to the six, seven sixth. Right? You don't have an asymptotic formula for this. But nevertheless, it comes up, if we go forward, it comes up as the main term. So here we have an asymptotic formula where we don't know the size of the main term. <laughs> oh, yeah, and, and again, you have a, um, a smaller, this, this corresponds to the major arcs, this corresponds to the whole integral. And so this corresponds to the minor arcs, I suppose. But Hooley um, showed that um, there's a positive contribution from both. Right? Um, so we know that this is this is proportional to at least qx, but we don't know if it isn't bigger. Okay. And again, this approximation which we used here is a, really a major arc approximation. Anyway, um, okay. So that's an interesting example. Okay. So uh, all the examples we've looked at so far have an order of magnitude approximately x, but Jörg Bruden and I recently looked at a case where the um, uh, uh, the number uh, this number would be civic, significantly smaller. We just look at r sub two of n, the number of ways of writing in the sum of two cubes, and um, you can see the lattice point argument tells you that the the L one mean is x to the two thirds, and the famous result of Hooley says that the L two mean is also about x to the two thirds. The number of representations is either zero or two, basically. Most of the time it's zero. Okay, so again, it's natural to use uh, the hardy Littlewood approach and to use this approximation here. And um, we find that again, you get an asymptotic formula, uh, this time a constant qx to the two thirds, which corresponds to the L2 mean. And I should point out here that the, the major arcs here are smaller than the, than the minor arcs. It's a well-known phenomenon. 
uh, they're only about qx to the one third in size. Okay, um, and the core of the proof uses uh, this major arc approximation. And that really simplifies the proof quite a bit. Okay, and there's a just recently we've been working on something which is even thinner. Um, the uh, sum of a kth power and an lth power with various choices of k and l, same techniques. They're quite, quite technically quite complicated, but it's doable. And I've just listed the results here. Okay, we should probably get on. I should probably finish in a second or two, but um, okay. So, um, okay. Oh, here's a question. Um, is this in the literature? Does anybody know if the Mobius function has been treated? I couldn't find it in the literature. Interesting question. Pretty easy to do, actually, once you've seen these techniques, but still. Anyway, so the first question I have is, is there a change of nature if lambda is less than a half? All the results we have are for, for when the size of this is bigger than x to the one half. What happens at x to the one half? Do things get worse? Better? Different? Are there any examples? Okay. Uh, another question which has come up, is there an asymptotic formula for this expression? Where now you just, you, fi you fix Q and you average over just the A's, not the Q's. You better take Q to be large. Uh, and it's known that, that there's an asymptot that it's asymptotically X log Q for almost all Q, starting by two. Okay. Um, Hurley apparently conjectured this uh, rather sloppily wrote for every Q or for, without saying anything about the Q. Uh, it's rather easy to show that it's false if Q is small. I mean, for example, if you take Q equals one, you've got Littlewood's theorem which says it's false. Um, but um, Furiel and Martin have shown that for a small range of Q, not going very far, it's false. But I think Hurley would have intended that Q is greater than X to the delta, maybe even that Q is greater than X to the one half. But I, know, I think it's kind of hopeless, but still, it's an interesting question. We do know it's true for almost all Q for quite big ranges, okay? And there's some results here, which I've listed as well. Okay, the second question I have is um, related to this. Um, so if you know um, uh, how to deal with the montgomery hooley kind estimate for a general expression like this, can you prove something? For, for when you just uh, sum over the A's, not over both Q and A. Is there, a, is there something general going on here? Can you prove something? I haven't really thought about it very much, but it seems an interesting question. There may well be examples of, of sequences AN where you could actually prove something, right? It'd be interesting for somebody to have a look and see. Anyway, um, and Hooley may even have looked at some of this stuff, in, in, at least for almost all Q in some of his papers. Okay, so that's, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>